Person choose the decision to participate would be the NAACP's, and Greenberg eventually decided to take part. Turn the page. <laughs> While no multi sponsored second summer project did take place, in 1955, the Southern Christian Leisure Conference sponsored the Summer Community Organization and Political Education Scope with 180 student volunteers in 30 Georgia and Alabama counties. Like the 64 Freedom Summer in Mississippi, they registered very few voters. The New York meeting was an early signal to Snick and Kofo that liberals wanted to control the Mississippi movement. In January 1965, Dorothy Zellmer, whom I see seated there, then head of Boston Friends of Snick, reported that graduate student Barney Frank, a Lawnstein protege and recruiter for the 64 Freedom Summer, told her that a series of meetings had been held to change the decision-making base of Kofo so it won't be dominated by Snick. Frank told Zellner that a new governing board would be controlled by people who would put resources into Mississippi in the future. The new groups disagreed with Snick's view of society, Zellner reported. What they want is to change it, let the Negro into the existing society, not to change it. Liberals like Lowenstein were right to be worried about Snick's politics and direction in the late 1964. Snick correct to be worried about Lewis's, about liberals. John Lewis's March on Washington speech had been censored after president from liberals in the White House. The liberal foundations that supported the voter education project gave SNCC less money than they gave other civil rights groups, although SNCC had more staff during more work in more places. Liberals had threatened to cut off legal help from the NAACP Legal Defense Fund if SNCC accepted help from the Lawyers Guild. SNCC wanted to do more than challenge segregation in the Deep South. As the Democratic Convention in Atlantic City, it intended to challenge the Democratic Party itself. As the Mississippi staff prepared for the Atlantic City change and slowed down from Freedom Summer, the SNCC voter registration project in Selma, Alabama, and Central East, Alabama was heating up. But that is another story for another day. For the first and last time in modern America, a sizable number of college-aged black and white youth engaged in massive and risky civil rights protests in the United States. There have been other times and in some other places where political activism arose among the young, but the 1960s particularly come to mind. Why then? And why not since? And why not now? Why don't college-age young people gather together now to ensure that the unregistered are registered and the large population of occasional voters are encouraged to cast their votes? We are told in every off-year election that the party out of power will lose votes, the president's party will lose le legislative seats, his party will suffer defeats. Why does that have to be so? What would it take to get the people in this room and the people they know and people elsewhere to dedicate their free time and weekends to civic activity, to registering voters, to helping them become aggressive citizens, to ensure the good guys win and the bad guys lose? Do it for Mickey Schwerner, James Cheney, and Andy Goodman. Young people can show their elders the way because this is a job for everyone. Howard Zinn, whom I met when he was a professor at Atlanta Spelman College, wrote about the risks and rewards of participating in a movement for social change. He said, even if people lack the customary attributes of power, money, political authority, physical force, as did the black people of the Deep South, there is a power that can be created out of spent up indignation, courage, and inspiration of a common cause. And if enough people put their minds and bodies to that cause, they can win. It is a phenomenon recorded again and again in the history of popular movements against injustice all over the world. Not to believe in the possibility of dramatic change is to forget that things have changed. Not enough, of course, but enough to show what's possible. We've been surprised before in history. We can be surprised again. Indeed, we can do the surprising. The reward for participating in a movement for social justice is not the prospect of future victory. It is the exhilaration of standing together with other people taking risks together, enjoying small times, and enduring disheartening setbacks. Together, let us go forward in that struggle. Thank you. Prominently in Selma, where she had a literacy project uh, and worked as a movement photographer. And her photographs um, are up here um, and around the room, as well as Sarah Jane Reed, who is a local activist photographer who has images of Chicago struggles um, paralleling Maria's uh, images of the struggles in 1960. Uh, next to Maria is uh, Fanny Rushing. Uh, Fanny Rushing is a Chicagoan, um, a scholar whose um, activism was as a freedom summer, as a freedom uh, school teacher uh, for five years, but also two other aspects of Fanny Rushing's activism are very important. Uh, one was as a northern solidarity worker, that is, in Chicago, uh, building solidarity for the movement in the South. 
but also then later uh, in her career as a transnational uh, solidarity activist with Cuba and uh, also with Africa Solidarity, which very much comes out of the experience um, of SNCC. Next to Fanny is Charlie Cobb. Um, Charlie Cobb is a legendary figure in SNCC. When I was doing my research on Ella Baker, everyone kept saying, you've got to talk to Charlie Cobb, you've got to talk to Charlie Cobb. I finally did um, tie down Charlie Cobb and get an interview with him. But he was a Howard University student um, who got involved in activism, uh, first in Annapolis, Maryland, um, and then migrated to Mississippi where he worked for five years. Um, Charlie's often described as one of the people who inspired the formation um, of freedom schools. Uh, he went on to become a journalist um, and an activist, uh, an activist on global um, issues. Zahara Simmons is uh, next to Charlie Cobb. Zahara Simmons is a scholar project directors uh, in Laurel, Mississippi. She was uh, describes herself as someone who was a Spelman girl at the time. That was the reference, right? She was, a, she was a good Spelman girl who was discouraged by her family from getting involved in activism, but she didn't listen. Uh, and she, she got curious and then she got active and, and has been active ever since and has an activist daughter that many of us uh, know and love who's a wonderful filmmaker. Next to her is Dottie Zellner, who worked in Mississippi and New Orleans and Massachusetts and in Atlanta alongside Julian Bond uh, in the communications office uh, and working for the Student Voice. Uh, she later went on to work for the Center for Constitutional Rights in New York and was one of the founders uh, of the Ella Baker uh, internship program. Uh, so join me in welcoming, and, and of course, Julian Bond, who's already received his introduction. Uh, and, and probably needs not. But join me in welcoming this wonderful. So I'm going to ask a few uh, general questions and invite people to, to, to be succinct in their answers so we all have a chance to, um, so everyone has a chance to speak. But um, I was reminded in seeing the, the images that Julian provided and, and reading those excerpts. I mean, that was actually my mother's Mississippi. My mother uh, was born in Sunflower County and of course, you know, heard these stories. You didn't know that? No. Yes, yes, yes. Born the same year as Fannie Lou Hamer in uh, Sunflower County, Mississippi. Um, so I, I grew up hearing stories about Mississippi, but it was a dangerous place and you all were amazingly young and brave. Uh, so I, I want to ask you, you know, what what your thoughts were, what your freedom dreams were when you made the choice to go south in the summer uh, of, in some cases, 1964, in some cases uh, earlier. Uh, each of you don't have to answer each question, but I wanted to start with that open-ended question. Anybody can jump in. Um, Use the mic, Charlie, please. Firstly, uh, you have to understand the sit-ins as actions in which young people challenge other young people to do something. So when the sit-ins erupted in 1960, I was in the 12th grade, and I'm seeing them on television. But what I saw for the first time was young people taking on uh, white supremacy and civil rights. Up until then, uh, Civil rights have been something that grown-ups did. And there's a larger point embedded in this comment, and that is that if you really want to understand what I think of as the freedom movement more than I think of as the civil rights movement, then what you have to understand is that as much as it is affected by protests and challenges against white supremacy, it is more meaningful, was more meaningfully shaped by the challenges that black people made to other black people within the black community. And that's what drove me south, seeing that kind of challenging and recognizing that you had to take on white supremacy. Um, I was already from the south, from born and raised in Memphis, Tennessee, and I had heard about Mississippi all of my life, so I knew how bad it was down there. Um, and 
yet once I got to Atlanta and uh, just saw the movement swirling all around me, and of course uh, Spellman was located about oh my a few blocks from the SNCC uh, headquarters that had to have Raymond Street, a hole in the wall. And they would come onto the campus, and it's following up on what you said, Charlie, challenging us to join the next demonstration. And of course, Spellman was threatening us and daring us you know, to get involved. But here were these people, they were my age. Uh, a number of them had dropped out of college uh, to work, and they really made me feel bad. Uh, <laughs> they were like, you know, what are you doing for your freedom? And you know, they were really, I think of Willie Ricks in particular, and everybody who was in SNCC know you Willie Ricks. Uh, boy, could he get on your last nerve. So, uh, you know, and, and uh, I guess he must have seen a weak spot in me because he, he really pushed on it. So that was, uh, you know, the challenge there. But uh, since I've, in my latter years, started teaching uh, at a college, I realized the role that Stuart Lynn and Howard Zinn, and even though Benson Harding was not teaching at that time, uh, here were scholars who started teaching me history that I did not know. And so a big part of that was the history of our struggle as a people that I had no knowledge of. And so that also had a tremendous influence. And lastly, uh, just by accident, joining the West Hunter Street Baptist Church uh, under orders from my grandmother to join a church as soon as I got there, uh, and not even knowing who Ralph Abernathy was. So I just sort of stumbled into this big church that's close to the campus, and it's Ralph Abernathy, who I later learned is very close to Dr. King. And so I'm getting it sort of uh, in a religious message on Sundays that this was the time. So these things were really impacting on me, and by the time uh, in 1964, I started school in 62, so over those two years, uh, you know, I was really being pushed. And so by the time uh, I learned about the Mississippi Freedom Summer, I learned through Stuart Lynn, who was working on the Freedom School curriculum, and I began to, uh, as a student in his class, in that second year, work on that uh, curriculum project for a grade, as a matter of fact. So I just decided I have to go, even though I'm terrified, uh, as I learned more about what was being planned, it was like, you know, you gotta do this. I mean, and just pray that you're gonna survive it. Okay. Uh, I remember the exact uh, in a coffee shop and near 42nd Street in Manhattan, and I was reading the Times, and I think it was on page 16 or page 38 or some back page, smoking, because we all smoked like chimneys then. <laughs> and I looked and I couldn't believe this. In my case, uh, I am a couple of, of more years older. I was Actually, the SNCC, I was old. In my, I was 26 in 1964, and that was old. Um, I am, uh, I would say, a World War II baby. And as a Jewish person, the war lived in our house. And I was seven in 1945, when the war was over. Uh, over. Um, I, I can't claim any great conversion in my mind. I came from a red diaper baby. I'm a red diaper baby. I came from a left-wing family. Um, I knew I had a moral imperative that you do not stand idly by. Okay? And I read this newspaper. I said, gotta go. Now, I was fortunate I wasn't married, I didn't have a partner, I didn't have children, I, didn't, I just graduated school, 
nothing holding me back. I had to go. And being in SNCC has affected my entire life from the day that I went south in 1960, four months after the city movement to today, I have followed what SNCC taught me. I want to invite um, some thoughts and, and, and comments, um, maybe from Fanny, uh, Nax, and, and, and Peter, um, and then we're gonna we're gonna pause our conversation and invite D. Alexander to come in and rev us up with some songs, and then we're gonna continue our conversation. That wasn't our plan, but we're gonna shift to that plan um, as a way to to prolong this conversation, but also to allow D to share with us because she was on a a tight schedule, but I think that would be energizing rather than a distraction, so uh, so we'll do that. But the question I wanted to ask, you know, uh, and it's been hinted at, and not hinted at, it's been discussed in Julian's comments, sometimes from a distance we look back at historical moments uh, with a kind of romantic view. Um, Maria might also have comments on this. I can't see everybody. So that's no, that's okay. I know you're there. Um, <laughs> is the, the internal politics and the internal struggles that made the movement what it was and in some ways made it stronger. Uh, but I think that's an important part of the story, the difficulties within movement circles that people you know, paid attention to, plotted through, plowed through. Um, does anybody want to say, particularly in Freedom Summer, I mean, Julian talked about it, there were, um, conflicts around privilege, around racism um, in the movement, and, and I think that's a part of the story that's an important layer. I don't know if anybody wants to speak to that. Well, I was one of the, this next step, is this one? Can you yes. Yes. yes, I was really against the summer project. My, I, I spent the summer of 64 in Selma with my own summer project where I had recruited four Afro-American students um, a couple from the south, a couple from the north to come and work in Selma. Um, the movement there needed some literacy work in order to get people to go down and fill out the 21 question test. Um, and I just knew logistically what I was dealing with with four students and how was SNCC going to deal with like a thousand even though only 600 maybe ever showed up. A. B. I really had the sense that this would overwhelm all the work that had been done to build grassroots leadership, you know, and how people, you could just see young people changing under the sort of mentorship of both the older SNCC um, staff as well as Ms. Baker, and I just thought, this is a disaster. Um, and honestly, it wasn't until I was writing my essay in Hands on the Freedom Plow that I had this epiphany about, you know, <laughs> I am ever practical and often clueless. It's like, um, history doesn't wait for things. There couldn't be any more murders like were happening in Mississippi. There just couldn't be. Something had to break this open. It was going to be really messy. It was going to be like childbirth. It's going to be horrible, terrible, wonderful, and beautiful. And so, but it took me years to get to that point where I could say um, it had to happen. Wow. Can I I have very little profound to say about the internal struggles, which were there and uh, present, but they were present with uh, the SNCC staff and, if you will, my elders. I was a volunteer, and I was there to do a job, and I was there to do a job that I agreed with tactically, strategically, and to be allowed to do it with these idols of mine having been involved in uh, picketing Woolworths uh, around the cities, having been involved in New York City in high school uh, as a student activist and with the frustrations, etc., having worked in the national office for the March on Washington with stick staff for a whole summer, having been in North Carolina and burned out of a summer camp uh, the year before. So I... Uh, Again, you're bringing me back to being the kid, and I love it. And so, I mean, I was just absolutely enraptured with the leadership. I was absolutely committed to uh, 
of the necessity of black leadership for the movement. And I was there to do a job and being allowed to participate was the most wonderful thing. And what I learned about organizing, about talking to people, is irreplaceable. Now, I must say, and I'll add another word on this, uh, the, I, when I was asked, or when I was asked as the years went on, I was, I was part of something very briefly called the uh, Route 40 uh, movement or process or whatever they called it, the uh, core had uh, in, uh, on the way to Washington. Washington was a segregated city at the time uh, in the 50s. And uh, uh, when we were on the prayer pilgrimage for Peter in 1955, there was nowhere to go. Uh, after the march in Washington, D.C., we wound up at a White Castle uh, because you could buy it at a counter. So this entire country was absolutely riven uh, with this poison of racism into its capital, and you heard uh, the manifestation of that with the president. That was a personal issue for me. I was born in 45, I was not there in 45, but I had a mother that said, uh, you can think of yourself whatever you want to think of yourself, but when they collect you for the cattle cars, you're a Jew, and you remember that you're a Jew, and racism in this country is the same issue that Jews were killed in Germany for, and it is the same issue and it, if they come for blacks, they'll come for you tomorrow. The fact that you can't live where you want to live, that you can't walk down the street with who you want to walk down the street with, that hurts you and it hurts whites. So this, you know, and all whites, this is not an issue for just liberation of African Americans. This was a gut issue for me and the whites. And my mother taught me that. Can I make one where was I think in the arguments that took place internally about the summer project and, and sort of like Maria, I was opposed to the summer project pretty much as what she said. Uh, but there's an important distinction between being an organizer and being a leader that exists in this argument that might be relevant today. If you're an organizer, you have to work within the consensus that exists in the community that you're organizing. And if you look at the arguments over the summer project, it was the organizers who were arguing against the summer project. Every single local person that we were working with in these communities who favored the summer project. Mrs. Hamer backed me up into a corner, said, Charlie, I'm glad you came down here. What's your problem with having other people come? What am I going to say? <laughs> You know, from the local person's point of view, from the point of view of the person you're working with or the people you're working with, in Mississippi in those days, people coming to Mississippi from the outside was a good thing. And the more people that came from the outside, the better it was. From the organizer's point of view, we worried about the kinds of things Maria was just talking about. That distinction is important because if you're going to organize the day, you're still going to have to figure out how to work meaningfully within the consensus that exists in whatever community you 